Welcome to another Scholastic Solutions video. Uh, today, Jared and I are joined by Dr. Nathan Greeley. Uh, he is a PhD in natural theology, uh, got his degree from Claremont Graduate University, uh, and he recently released a book on apologetics and the Lutheran approach. And we'd like to welcome him on today to talk about natural theology in Melanchthon. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So uh, Dr. Greeley, or Nathan, uh, we uh, had uh, some, we, Jared and I have read a little bit of Melanchthon, uh, but we uh, figured we could uh, let you kick off and give us some general ideas about the purpose of natural theology in Melanchthon, uh, what is natural theology looks like broadly, um, and how he relates to others in his time. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I think it's important to, to mention is that Melanchthon was a pretty eclectic thinker. He's not um, someone that you can really place in one particular school of thought. Uh, his, I would say his major influence philosophically is definitely Aristotle, but he, you know, read widely. He was one of the most learned men of the 16th century. Um, so to say that he's Aristotelian, and just leave it at that might not be sufficient. Um, he definitely drew from a lot of different places. He knew most classical writers very well. Um, so we're, we're talking about somebody that was able to synthesize a great deal of information um, and you know shape it towards uh, his own purposes. Um, I would say that with respect to natural theology, he there are two things that we see in his writings on this topic. One is that he has a empirical approach to it for the most part. So he's very much focused on proofs or arguments that can be gathered from observing the natural world. And another thing is that he's very practical in his orientation. So, uh, and those th two things are, are quite related, I think, in that practical things usually are quite empirical or related to what we observe in the world around us. Um, so he's interested in, in natural theology um, for its, ultimately for its spiritual benefits, for um, the ways in which it can edify believers. Um, he's not in a context in which it's that important that natural theology be used in apologetics. So, you know, he, being in the 16th century, where virtually everybody that he knows is a, a Christian, uh, everybody that he knows is a theist. He's not thinking we need arguments to persuade people that are um, antagonistic towards Christianity or, you know, are skeptics in that way. But he does think that these arguments still are of value, even when that, those apologetic interests are not uh, in the forefront of, of his mind. And I think that's kind of interesting just because today, when we look at these kinds of arguments, it's almost always in the context of apologetics. It's almost always in the context of, um, you know, refuting unbelievers or arguing for, you know, why people should should stay in the church and things like this. But in his context, it's really almost more of like a, a spiritual exercise to like look at these arguments and kind of examine them and, and understand what they have to tell us about God by means of the world. So it's a way of um, just contemplating, you know, the grandeur and the greatness of God that we can, that we can experience through creation. And he thinks that these arguments are function as a way to, you know, direct our attention to those things. So, and uh, one of the things that I think makes it evident that's what he's thinking, or that's the way he's approaching things, is that he puts his proofs in his um, Loki communities, he puts them in his locus on creation and so that after his locus on god so it's kind of like you might almost think of it as an afterthought but um i think really he's just putting it where he thinks it makes sense for it to be given that like i said he didn't have these apologetic concerns at least in the same way that we do today um where, because almost every systematic theology or whatever that you read today if there's proofs in there it's probably going to be in the prolegomena or it's going to be in the doctrine of god um, section. So there we see something significantly different, I think, just in terms of 
you know, the importance that he attributes to these and, and why he's interested. That's interesting. I, I noticed when I was reading through it, uh, some of that with his, his emphasis is certainly, even though he wasn't a pastor, is, is pastoral and directed towards piety and, and practical use. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, but he, it's interesting too, he doesn't discount them because they're not getting used in that, that way, you know, for him, they're still important. And, um, I think that's something that gets lost because a lot of times today, you know, it's kind of like, well, if you're not having, if you're not struggling with your faith or if you're not, you know, tempted by unbelief, then you can just ignore these kinds of things. Um, or they're not things that you need to concern yourself with. You can focus on, you know, the gospel and, and just, you know, thinking about, um, what Christ has done for you and things like that. And although that's certainly, you know, of chief importance, um, there's lots of ways that we can grow spiritually, lots of ways that we can um, think about God's glory and God's, God's greatness and all of his attributes. So um, natural theology provides a way of doing that. Yeah. So when, when you talk about uh, Melanchthon being somewhat empirical, um, could you uh, break down a little bit of what that means, I guess, perhaps in, in contrast sure. to other people? Sure. So if we look at uh, arguments for the existence of God, there's traditionally two broad ways of making these kinds of arguments. And one is called an a priori approach. And that basically attempts to argue that God exists without making reference to experience. So without making reference to things we observe or things that we sense, it's usually, um, you know, the key example is, is an argument called the ontological argument, which is argues from the concept of God. That God has to exist, or from the um, the idea of God that God has to exist, and it doesn't make a reference to our experience. But there's another type of argument, uh, or um, school, or I should say, family of arguments, and these are called a posteriori arguments, and these do make reference to experience or make reference to things that we uh, sense and observe. And all of Melanchthon's arguments are from or of the second kind. So. That's that's what I mean to say. He's not really the the first type of argument, the a priori arguments, are usually associated with more like rationalist or more speculative theologians, like Anselm of Canterbury and and uh, and others in that mold. But people who favor the a posteriori arguments, they tend to be more practical. They tend to be more empirical because they're just saying, well, let's you know look at what we see and see what we can infer on that basis. And we're not going to just, um, you know, just deal with concepts. We're not just going to deal with ideas. We want to um, start with something concrete, start with something that we can actually, um, you know, touch and, and see and things like that. And the idea I think is that, or at least the idea that a lot of people seem to have, is that those kinds of arguments, generally speaking, are more convincing or, or they seem more plausible to us, precisely because we are, um, you know, embodied beings, and because we do um, interact with the world through our senses, and that's our primary means of acquiring information is through through the senses. And that's what I mean by saying too that that Melanchthon was uh, chiefly a, a disciple or a pupil of uh, Aristotle, because Aristotle is always seen as the one of the the great empiricists uh, in the classical tradition. So you have Plato, who's usually seen as more of like an idealist or a rationalist of sorts, and then you have um, Aristotle providing a counterpoint to that with his empiricism. So Melanchthon, I think, is is definitely um, somebody who who gravitates towards the Aristotelian, the empirical, the practical way of thinking about things, and because of that his interest in natural theology is, is primarily in these a posteriori arguments that look at creation, look at the physical world, and try to discover truths about God um, through those observations. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I was just going to say a few things. Um, it's funny that you mentioned Anselm. I actually have the monologian right next to me. I've been reading through it, but mm -hmm. it's cool that when you read a lot of these theologians and these philosophers, they are like Melanchthon in that they use natural theology not just to be persuading unbelievers, but also to edify our own understanding. Um, because in, in the monologian, for example, Anselm talks about, well, in what sense do we talk about God existing? And it really brings you this understanding of God's transcendence where he says, um, I, I'm not going to have it a perfect quote, but he says something along the lines of, 
we don't exist in an unqualified way compared to God or the supreme nature, as he calls it for a while. Um, we don't even exist. It's such an interesting concept and shows the full reality of God. Um, and I just, I, I thought I did. I, it's so interesting to see how Melanchthon is an Aristotelian, especially off of um, a lot of the attacks that uh, Luther had against Aristotle. And I know this is a whole other topic, but it's really enlightening to see that there's a way that you can use Aristotle in this very practical sense, because sometimes Aristotelianism can be used really specul speculatively to where we go beyond what scripture gives us. But Melanchthon seems to really be um, conservative with it, where he uses it in the most practical sense. And I think that should give us a good model of how we should be doing our natural theology. Yeah, and that brings up an interesting point about Melanchthon's biography or about his development in terms of his thinking. Um, when he was a young man, like when he first came to, to Wittenberg or even before then, he was very much um, an advocate or a fan of Aristotle. But then he gets to Wittenberg and he comes under Luther's influence. And you see for a few years that he, he doesn't show much interest in Aristotle and most of the comments that he makes about Aristotle are pretty disparaging. So you do see that change in his outlook. But then when you get into the late 1520s and into the 1530s and after that, you see that he has kind of this like um, chastened view, I guess you might say, where he's adopted an evangelical standpoint, of course, with law and gospel and things like that. So he's taken on board the criticisms of Aristotle that Luther has made but he's also come to see that even in light of those criticisms, or even in spite of them, uh, there are still things in Aristotle that are worth learning from and worth studying. And in a lot of ways, I think you see there kind of the beginnings or, or the, the germ, you might say, of later Lutheran scholasticism, because you're, you're getting this like combination of these two influences um, and an idea of how they can be synthesized in those writings of Melanchthon from the you know late 20s and onwards. Um, in particular, he was he did think that you know Luther was very much opposed to Aristotle's ethics. But what Melanchthon came to see and believe is that uh, Aristotelian ethics is actually very useful as long as we circumscribe what we what it can be applied to. So with respect to external or civil righteousness, what he has to say about ethics is actually true and, and good and, and worth holding on to. It's only in the context of our, our righteousness towards God or you know how we become justified that what Aristotle has to say is no longer relevant. So uh, obviously uh, I did not mention this at all before this, but do you know in particular what uh, might have caused him to have a little bit of shift of mind to being a little bit more favorable towards Aristotle? Or I think, not really know? I think a lot of it just had to do with being in a university setting and having to teach courses on a variety of subjects and, and just realizing that uh, the resources that Aristotle um, provides are, are still useful and still necessary in some ways because there's, you know, there's certainly things that you're going to be studying in a course of study at a university that, um, you know, the Lutheran, Luther's theology, you know, is not necessarily going to speak to, at least not directly. So there are things that you're going to have to, um, you know, pull into your curriculum from other sources. Um, another thing, too, is that the 1520s was kind of a tumultuous decade, and Melanchthon witnessed a lot of uh, behavior that troubled him, you know, a lot of ignorance, a lot of um, immorality and things like that, that he, he believed were um, not necessarily the result of the Reformation, but that the Reformation had, had perhaps presented an opportunity for these things, at least to some people. Um, and because of that, I think he, he felt that uh, emphasizing the importance of ethics and things like that uh, was, was important again. It was something that they needed to reemphasize after the initial break with Rome and the initial kind of reformation of the church that happened in the early years of the reformation. I think he thought that a emphasis on godly living 
was something that needed to be recaptured and, and restated. Um, and I, I think that he thought that, and, and just civil righteousness, you know, he felt like that was in decline. So he felt like those things needed to be reemphasized. And he thought that Aristotle provided um, a good um, resource for that. And with respect to that sphere, I think that's certainly true. If we're, if we're looking at our, you know, our righteousness towards other people, our righteousness in the civil sphere, I think that's right that Aristotle does provide um, helpful resources. It's just, you know, we don't want to mingle that, of course, with our righteousness uh, towards God or Coram Deo. Yeah, with the, I, I, that's interesting, especially with, in relation to the, the third use of the law in, uh, Luther mentions it, but once in his writing, uh, in its, in his, his antinomian disputations, but Melanchthon, uh, certainly has it in his Lucy and, and discusses it, uh, more thoroughly, which would make sense in that context. Right. So that was definitely something that interested him uh, in particular. And, and, you know, that may have just been because of his personality or his, you know, his dispositions that he had, but, um, I do think that by yeah by integrating these different influences, he had a, a lasting influence on the Lutheran tradition. And I think if we look at um, Lutheranism through you know the rest of the 16th and the 17th centuries, Melanchthon's influence is really just as important as Luther's. I don't think that you can really say that one is necessarily more important than the other. Obviously, Luther got things started, but in terms of the actual shape that things took af thereafter, I think Melanchthon's influence was just as prominent. And uh, some people, of course, think that's a bad thing. Some people think that all that Lutheran scholasticism is, is horrible stuff, and we just need to go back to Luther circa 1520, you know, and that's where our theology should be forever. Um, I'm not somebody that, that shares that view, but... Um, I think well, that I don't, I don't think we would either, considering our channel is named after the the Lutheran right. classics, after all. <laughs> right. I think that, generally speaking, I think that everything that happened after Luther's time, up until the Enlightenment, was largely salutary. It was largely good, and um, and I think Lutheran theology in the 17th century really flourished in a lot of ways. And I think that there's so much great stuff from that century that has not. Uh, you know, hasn't been translated and is largely unknown, but there's lots of gems buried in that, that century. So it would be great to just see more of it come to light. And, and that's happening, of course. I hope, my hope is that after Concordia is done with the Gerhardt translations, that they will turn to Kalov or, or Quench Dead or someone like that and just keep going. You know, I would love that, but we'll see what happens. Well, I can say uh, a few things. I'll try to be it. I'm kind of in the know on this, surprisingly, but I'll be okay. as um, good as I can. What's nice is that I know they're Eldona, and we're more on the LCNS AALC side of things, but Eldona actually does have some Quenstet stuff out. So I actually have his um, creation and of the church, and I've read the church. It's really good. And then I have a friend who I won't say what work she's translated at or translating, but I can tell you that I have a friend who is part of Justin Sinner or is working with them in some capacity and is working on translating some scholastic works. And yeah, hopefully um, once Concordia, they're done with Gerhard, they can continue to get into Halatz or Kalov and those figures because there's so much to get out of just any of our scholastic figures, right? I mean, even as a Lutheran, as a man who doesn't uphold to or doesn't use infused grace as justifying, Thomas Aquinas's information on grace is so in, um, interesting. And then we also have later figures. I mean, obviously within the Lutheran tradition, Martin Chemnitz, Johann Gerhard, their works are just, every single sentence is just packed with information and it's so edifying and so knowledgeable that I really hope we can get more of those works translated and popularized to educate our laity and hopefully lead to a real scholastic revival of sorts. Yeah, I think the effect on the Lutheran Church in America would, uh, and throughout the world, would definitely be very positive. And I think it would lead us in a, a good direction where we would become more true to ourselves and just more aware of, you know, what our, well, what makes us different and, and what we should be focused on. So, um, because I do see us as, you know, we are Protestant Catholics, basically, right? We're evangelical Catholics. And I think that that it's hard to um, 
it's hard to remember that or it's hard to understand why that's important or what what its significance is if we don't have these sources to draw on that kind of show us how to do that show us what that involves or what that's uh, what it entails so yeah i hope that you know we just keep seeing more and more good stuff i'm, I'm really happy and grateful that Gerhardt's available because i feel like that in itself has just made a huge difference you know in terms of what people think of as being normal for Lutherans, what people think of as being true Lutheranism, or, you know, um, like I said, there's a lot of people who in the 20th century wanted Lutheranism to kind of just be stuck with Luther 1.0, you know, back in the late 1510s and early 1520s, and never to kind of like move past that, those emphases that Luther, you know, was focused on then. But I see that as, as kind of a um, a narrowing of our tradition that's not really all that helpful or necessary. Um, I, I definitely appreciate the big picture Lutheranism that I see in the later scholastic writers that where they deal with all kinds of topics and they're interested in all, every facet of theology. It's not just, you know, a few things that, that Luther was primarily focused on as important as those things are. Um, so yeah, that's my, my basic take on that. Yeah, it's, I think it can be it can be easy in American Lutheranism to get to get trapped in that uh, just Luther and, and not exploring the other authors as much. Yeah, just Luther, just justification, nothing else really. You know, justification is not the the article by which the church stands or falls. It's the only article that we have any interest in whatsoever. You know, <laughs> <laughs> not the existentialists. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. 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 Uh, if you mentioned earlier the, the Enlightenment and uh, Melanchthon as a, as a pre-Enlightenment thinker uh, and as a Lutheran especially, I, I think he certainly has a, a, a strong take on uh, the, the fallen intellect of man and, and how that relates to his uh, natural theology. It seemed to me that that it impacts uh, his, his thought on that quite a bit. I would agree with that. I think that he does think that evidence of God is ubiquitous in the natural world. Like it's, you know, always pre present. It's always something that can be uh, seen and we should be sensitive to that. However, he does think that our knowledge that we acquire through nature is very limited. And Luther says quite similar things. Um, Luther also would agree that we know that God exists because of what we observe in nature. So Luther's not opposed to natural theology either. Uh, Melanchthon has more to say about it than Luther does. But, um, but he would say that we don't, we're not able to discover anything about God's will um, through natural theology. We're not able to discover the plan of salvation in any sense. Um, we're not able to discover truths like those of the Trinity or the incarnation. So all of these things remain opaque to us apart from special revelation. So what he's going to to say is that as great as the the signs of god's existence in creation are and and as important as they can be to contemplate and consider um for our, our spiritual i mean partly he thinks it's important for our spiritual well-being to contemplate these things just partly because it um he thinks it's so easy for us to kind of forget god right and to just start thinking about worldly things and to lose sight of what our ultimate aim and purpose is. And, um, and so he thinks that knowing how to look, basically how to look for signs of God's presence and God's reality in creation is a valuable asset for the Christian. It's a valuable skill to have. Um, he also thinks that there's an innate knowledge of God. So he thinks um, that there's both an innate and an acquired knowledge. So you see this distinction made in later Lutheran scholastics too. Virtually every Lutheran scholastic from Chemnitz onwards is going to say that there's an innate knowledge of God that we're born with, and that's connected to the natural law. Um, and that's something that we do suppress and something that we are able to ignore rather easily, but it is there. So that's that there's this implanted knowledge. And then there's also this acquired knowledge that we get through using arguments or through you know, making inferences on the basis of what we observe. But in both of those cases, with respect to either the innate or the acquired knowledge, he is going to say it is quite limited, uh, especially after the fall. So, you know, before the fall, um, 
you know, we were in a different situation and, and we didn't necessarily need to know everything that we know now to be saved, you know, like the gospel and so forth. Um, but he would have said our, our knowledge before the fall was certainly much more comprehensive than it is now. Now our knowledge is basically limited to the fact that there is a creator or there is um, a cause of the universe. And there's not, you know, some of the divine attributes, like the things that God must be or must have in order to, to make that possible or, or to make creation possible. Certainly he would say that we could infer those things, like that God is, you know, all powerful and things like that, or God is wise and so forth. But as far as God's will for us and God's intentions uh, for his creation and, and even our own fallenness and, and, you know, what our needs are in light of our fallenness, you know, the kind the kind of destitute state that we're in and the, the miserable and, and desperate state that we're in. He's going to say all these things need to come to us from special revelation. And without special revelation, we would have no, no hope. And um, so natural theology is good and it's important, but you have to understand like what it's for and what it actually can be used for. And outside of, of those, you know, purposes, those specific purposes for it that he thinks um, that God wills for us, there's, we have to just turn to scripture and we have to rely on what scripture tells us. So given that uh, Melanchthon sees that we naturally cannot discern the will of God uh, and our, our fallen intellects, um, and I don't know, this might be a little bit out of scope, but does he uh, draw any conclusions to that or from that regard with regard to natural law and what people know about good and evil on their own? So he does think that we have a natural law that is implanted in our minds or a knowledge of it, I should say, knowledge of the natural law implanted in our minds. And from that, we're able to discern, um, you know, in broad strokes, what is good and what is bad and what is honorable and what is shameful and what is to be done and what is to be avoided. So he would say that that knowledge is present uh, in all human beings. He would say it's much, it's, it's, um, definitely distorted after the fall you know it has definitely deteriorated it's not nearly as sharp as it used to be it's not as acute as it used to be uh, it's very easy for people to make mistakes or to misjudge when it comes to what is right and what is wrong um, to apply these things you know in particular cases or instances but he is going to say that we all have uh, just by virtue of being human we have a knowledge of what is right and wrong and we have a knowledge that we're obligated to do what is right. And we have not, and that obligation um, is dependent on there being a lawgiver and, and being a judge to whom we're accountable. So he thinks that there is a, that's the innate knowledge of God and the innate knowledge of the natural law. He thinks of them as being connected, right? So you get, when you get one, you get the other. Your knowledge of what is right and wrong comes with this knowledge that you're accountable to a, a you know, a creator or higher power that you need to obey and you need to recognize and respect and uh, and honor well it certainly sounds a uh, pauline and at least yeah so so it is exactly so if you look at um his commentary on romans on romans 2 um you know he says exactly what you would expect him to say that everybody has the law of nature written on their hearts and everybody knows what is good and what is evil um and it's just a matter of um after the fall, there's a, a real lack of willingness to do what we know to be good. Um, but we do know that we do know these things, and we do know that God is the lawgiver. And we know that we're accountable to Him. So we have a, a little bit under nine minutes left here. Uh, I did want okay. to ask a question um, with regard to is uh, Trinitarian theology, and you mentioned this briefly before that um, he doesn't think we can discover the Trinity uh, through natural reason, which would. Uh, be in the same uh, tradition as most of the uh, medievals does he does he use natural theology at all in his doctrine of the trinity and, and perhaps in a way like like augustine uses uh, philosophy of mind to make a model does does melanchthon right. have that at all or does he, does he separate them pretty strongly so i would yeah he separates them pretty strongly as far as i can tell so you're right that uh, augustine and and others that followed augustine oftentimes talked about there being uh, vestig vestigia or, you know, footprints of God or of the triune, you know, reality in creation. And so there were these like, um, you know, in the human mind, 
there would be like memory and reason and will and things like this that would be um, symbols of something that was both three and one at the same time, right? And Melanchthon doesn't really talk much about that stuff. I think because from his point of view, that would be um, unnecessarily speculative. And like I said, he's he's pretty practical in his thinking. And I think he thinks that the Trinity is sufficiently established by scripture. And to, you know, to look for signs of it elsewhere, well, they might be there, but at the same time, you know, this is quite debatable and, and it's not, it's not clear cut or it's not obvious. And so therefore, I think he would say that when it comes to that doctrine, we just need to accept it as a revealed doctrine and not as something that's, um, or I should say revealed in special revelation or in, in, through scripture, not something that we find in nature. That's interesting. So, so he, he perhaps departs a little bit from the, the earlier uh, medievals, if, if we can consider him a medieval. Uh, they yeah, so I, I think his view, is, his view is probably the same as that of Aquinas on that topic. So Aquinas would, you know, doesn't think that we can discern the reality of the Trinity by looking at nature. He thinks that's only something we know from the Bible. And I think Melanchthon and, and Luther too, and, and most of virtually all of the reformers, I think, took that same approach um, to this topic. Very That's well. interesting. Um, do we have, do you think we have time for one more quick question? I mean, we have roughly six minutes yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, so we mentioned in the beginning of this that, you know, you have a new book out. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually on apologetics. It's an introduction to apologetics. Um, I'm curious, did Melanchthon's understanding of natural theology influence you as you wrote that book? Um, and further, if you have a little time to answer this as well, how do you think we can apply what Melanchthon has taught us on natural theology to the world today? The primary influence for me in writing the book was probably Gerhardt. Like I was reading Gerhardt while I was writing it and thinking about what he had to say about the, the being of God and things like that. Um, but like I said, a lot of what Gerhardt says ultimately originates in what Melanchthon was saying and doing back in the 1520s and 30s in terms of this like creating the synthesis of uh, Luther, Luther's theology and, and Aristotle's philosophical insights. Um, so I think that it definitely was an influence, but perhaps indirectly is the right way to put it. But it definitely, I'd say generally speaking, the, the tone of the book and the overall approach to apologetics of the book is um, Melanchthonian. I would say that's true, um, but mostly because I think Gerhardt is kind of in that, that line of influence, or he's in that stream of influence that comes from Melanchthon. And as far as today goes, I think that Natural theology is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's definitely important in the context of apologetics. A lot of people, because of the influence of things like, um, you know, Hume and Kant and um, Darwin and things like that, and and also Lutheran theologians who, in the wake of those figures and in light of other philosophical influences, decided to kind of downplay natural theology or even dismiss it in the 20th century you know the existentialists and people influenced by by positivism and and things like that um there's a lot of christians that are not um up to speed when it comes to natural theology like they, they don't really know that um much about it they you know the idea that you can show or demonstrate that god exists might strike them as strange or is something that's odd or implausible um you know, as I, I teach university courses in Introduction to Philosophy, and it's at a Christian university, but you might be surprised at how many of the people in my classes think that you can't prove that God exists, you know, and I just wonder, like, well, where did you, where did you hear this, or where did you pick this up, you know, and where, where what's the ultimate source of this, um, because I think that our churches should do a better job, probably, of of telling people that yeah, actually you can show that there's good reasons to believe that God exists. And it's not just a matter of blind faith, or it's not just a matter of taking um, the Bible's word for it as much as we should do that. You know, we do have these corroborating 
sources of, of evidence that we should also consider. So um, I think in apologetic context, I think it's important, especially because unbelief is such a big problem today and it just seems to be getting worse as time goes on, uh, particularly as our culture becomes more anti-Christian, it's going to become harder and harder to keep our you know, young people in the church and things like that. So we definitely need to uh, make sure that they're aware that these arguments exist. They might not choose to, you know, take them seriously, or they might not choose to think much about them, but they should at least know that they're there and that they, uh, a lot of people have found them to be quite plausible and convincing. Um, and then also, I didn't touch much on this in the apologetics book, but I also think that we should also think about natural theology and study it just for the purpose of spiritual edification, which is something that I talked about earlier with, you know, what I think Melanchthon's goals were, uh, because I think that's kind of a lost art too. It's just using philosophy or using natural philosophy in the study of, of nature as a means to grow spiritually. I think that's something that people, because for so long now, people have thought of science and religion as being opposed or, um, you know, a focus on the natural world and a focus on spiritual matters is kind of being, you know, irreconcilable or, or not at least not having anything to do with each other. And I think that um, if we were to think about these things more often, think about all of the ways in which God's reality is revealed to us in nature, all of the signs of God's existence that we can, we can gather just from contemplating his works, I think that that would be a benefit for all of us. Um, it wouldn't distract us from what's important. I think it would help us to remember what's important. Certainly. Well, uh, thank you for coming on, Nathan, and uh, yeah, thank you for thank joining you. Jared too. Uh, this was this was great to to have you here and discuss these things. Uh, yeah, it's thanks, been fun. It's a pleasure. So, uh, thank you. Hopefully, everyone, we can do it again sometime. Dr. Nathan Greeley, uh, check out his book on apologetics. And that'll be all for today.